Everybody, goodminds.com is proud to present 13 Moons, 13 Reads, showcasing Indigenous authors, poets, and illustrators from across Turtle Island and the cultural teachings of the 13 Moons on Turtle's Back. I am your host each month, each moon. My name is Janet Rogers. I'm Mohawk Tuscarora from Six Nations of the Grand River, I, where I live and work. And I'm a writer myself and a new publisher with the Ojisto Publishing Label. And I'm really excited to be chatting with our special guest for the September moon, multidisciplinary artist Casey Adams. Casey is a Winnipeg-based artist who graduated from Concordia University with a BFA in studio arts. She has had several solo exhibitions, group exhibitions, and was included in the photo quai. I'm going to ask if that's correct. Uh, Biennale does uh, the image, image du monde in Paris, France. She has participated in residencies at the Bound Center, the uh, Confederation Art Center in Charlottetown, the National Museum of the American Indian, and the Parramatta Arts Gallery in Australia. Recently, she was uh, the set designer for the Royal Winnipeg uh, Ballet going home star. I kind of want to talk to you about that. We'll see if we have time, uh, um, which is at the role, uh, the Truth of Reconciliation. She completed a public art sculpture for the United Way of Winnipeg called Community. And uh, she has an ongoing public art campaign called Perception uh, that was on display all over Winnipeg, Manitoba and Lethbridge, Alberta. And she recently won the Winnipeg Arts Council Making a Mark Award an Aboriginal uh, Circle of Educators Trailblazing Award. All well-deserved. I am familiar with your work. I've been following your career and I'm a fan. Uh, but before we get into our chat, Casey, uh, we're going to learn a little bit about the September moon. And we learn, we learn each month about um, um, the moon by uh, from Debbie Beach to Charmin. Debbie is Ojibwe from Lake Manitoba First Nations, also known as Dog Creek Treaty Two Territory. So please take it away, Debbie. So the next um, teaching is the ninth moon of the calendar, and in Anishinaabemowin we call this uh, moon. The the uh, which means the fall moon, and the fall moon is is the time of change in our community, because um, you see lots of changes around, including uh, Mother Earth's hair, which turns color, all the different beautiful colors of red, yellow, orange, and brown. And this is um, an indication that change is coming and cre creation prepares us to endure the upcoming season of the winter. And uh, this is a time in preparation because uh, all the things that we celebrated from the spring during the summer goes to sleep at this time. And so the long winter um, that we're prepared for, and it's a long sleep that takes care of the earth and prepares us for the change that's to occur. Miigwech. Okay, so Nyao Goa, Miigwech, Chimikwech, Debbie, for teaching us about the September moon when our, we are busy harvesting from our gardens, and then soon we'll be getting ready to put our gardens to bed. I know that's um, the phase that I'm at right now. Are you a gardener, Casey? Uh, I try to be. It doesn't always work. This year was <laughs> terrible. We had a drought, so... Oh. My poor tobacco is like this high. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> but well, I had an abundance of strawberries, so that's good. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, because strawberries are usually like the, the wet, the sandy uh, soil. But anyway, uh, we could talk about gardening on another show, perhaps. <laughs> That would be fun. Now we want to say uh, sego ani uh, to a very special guest, K uh, Casey Adams. We are mostly going to focus on Casey's books uh, and one titled Perception, a photo series, uh, which is available through goodminds.com. And I gave our viewers a rundown of your vast accomplishments in the bio, Casey. But I think, you know, we, we like to hear from our guests themselves. What is it that you'd like our viewers to know about you that I didn't cover in the, in the, in the bio? Well, Tanse, Totema, Kapapama, Pemanat, Mekasuas Goyo, Nitisanakasan, 
I name Mama Judy Adams and uh, Leslie Adams. Um, I said hello in Cree. Uh, my Cree name is Flying Overhead in Circles Eagle Woman. And I come from my mother, Judy Adams, and I also, who's from Fisher River Cree Nation um, here in Manitoba, Treaty 5. And my father's family comes from Treaty 1 territory. He is Anishinaabe Cree and and English, which is where I get my British side and the Adams name. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm just really happy to sit down and talk with you about some of the goings on and that's been happening in my career. Yeah, I love I love it when artists kind of like breach the binary of what they're doing to just say, you know, we're as Indigenous people, we don't recognize borders necessarily. And we do that in our lives and in our creative practices. And that's what I, I love about what you're doing. It's like there's I'm going to you know, you say I'm going to create these this uh, series of photos. And now here's the book. And then maybe yeah. we'll see the play and then maybe, you know what I mean? It's, there's uh, endless possibilities with that. But, um, and I know that you have defined yourself as a social practice artist and, and I'm wondering if you had coined that phrase or, 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 or uh, also I want to know like, how, how do you define that? No, I wish I had coined it, but it really talks about the way we think as Indigenous people, we think about community. So when you think about social practice artists, it's about artwork that impacts a community. It, uh, oftentimes what happens is the artist will work with a community group to create something that uh, visualizes uh, their thoughts and ideas. So um, I know in some places in the United States, there are artists who work with, say, homeless people to come up with uh, creative dwellings for them to exist and live. So when I heard the title Social Practice Artist, I realized, oh, well, I've been doing that since early on in my career with, uh, I did a photo series called Cyborg Hybrids, and I realized, okay, I, I've been doing this. So the, so I decided, well, you know what, it really gives a better understanding about how community is important. And it's sort of an Indigenous way of thinking. So I, I decided to use that label. I love that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, even as uh, journalists or authors, there is a, a difference. And I'm not going to say whether it's a better or worse, but there is a difference um, between when we take autonomy over our own stories and our own expressions or when non-native people do that and we have seen that kind of like almost a complete flip where the non-native gaze is no more it's on its way out you know and I'm just so pleased about that's what you're doing now when you say that you're working with community how are you currently defining community for you like who would be who is in that what does that look like well, definitely, well, I'm just going to jump in when I'm talking about my perception photo series, which is based on the book that we're going to be talking about. Um, I went specifically uh, to talk about my own Indigenous community. So I'm part Cree, part Anishinaabe, I'm part um, British. And so when I basically took the initiative to... Um, combat racism and discrimination that was happening in my community, I decided, okay, I need to give my community a voice and I need them to be able to share how they perceive themselves as opposed to how media perceives them. So the, that's one of the reasons why I created that piece in the, in the first place is so that I could give them a voice. But definitely when you think about perception photo series now it's also speaking to the non-indigenous community as well and it has had a big impact on them in what way well I've had people come to me um, and tell me their stories of when they encountered the work and how it initiated a conversation with in their family or within their friends uh, for example I was talking with a group of young uh, lawyers or they're studying to become lawyers. And one of them had said he discussed about the hiring processes and how there's that hidden discrimination. And he asked point blank his family and friends, 
if you were to see an Indigenous person and a non-Indigenous person and they come to you for a job interview, would how would you react? And they have the same credentials. Would you would you consider the Indigenous uh, person for that position? So th these kind of conversations were happening. Even my mom's um, bridge club, uh, <laughs> they they started talking about about the photo series and their position on racism and discrimination. And that's when I, I realized, wow, this has gone beyond my community. And now uh, my Winnipeg community, or at least my Manitoba community are now discussing it. And they're part of the process. Now they're part of the art piece right? in a way. Right, yeah, no, um, their, and their stories are included. Um, in a way, you know, like there you're you're asking them to react um, and we'll get to that in the process in a little bit here. But sure. I love the fact that, you know, that there you're asking them to also define themselves. So so being self-aware is also mm -hmm. part and parcel of, of what you're of what you're exhibiting. And, you know, in a country, if I if I could say uh, that is has been for hundreds of years suffering from an identity crisis, you're uh, you're putting in place. You guys may be suffering from this identity crisis, but we're going to let you know who we are without any question. And that's yeah, what yeah, exactly. About. And one of the, I mean, that's just one of the reasons why I wanted to take this work and turn it into a publication so that it could have more of an outreach was because um, people wanted to keep the conversation going. And uh, also people wanted to bring it into the classrooms and talk about it as well. So mm -hmm. I contacted my publisher and I just said, uh, would you be interested in, in taking this on? And they were so excited. It was great. Right on, right on. Now you get to go to literary festivals <laughs> or, <laughs> or bring it to, into the library. You know, this is so wonderful. Yeah. I just love it when um, art pieces have a, have a broader life than the yeah. gallery wall. This is so exciting. Um, you know, you had mentioned in another interview that uh, you also uh, attend, a, part of your community includes attending the Na Nabe, Nabe gathering. Nabe gathering, and, yeah. Yeah, and um, it's, you know, where people are on the land and you're sharing teachings about the land and water and things like that. And then it occurred in then, but you had to go virtual. So how was that talking and teaching and sharing land knowledge and water knowledge virtually not being on the land? How did that work? Well, what we did was um, for myself, I, I like to do teachings about land and water and make those connections by having people touch the clay the clay that is that was shaped by water, Nibe. I want people to make that connection to land and water by using clay. And so what I had to do was do some instructional videos so that people could go out actually out on the land and dig up their own clay, hmm. which we can't always do at the Nibe gathering because it requires to prepare the clay ahead of time. So this was actually quite nice. It allowed me to do these instructional videos and then people were able to dig up their own clay. And then we did a live virtual um, workshop where people were able to actually work with the clay that they processed. They collected from the land, Excellent. they put tobacco down Excellent. and they were able to um, make that, that vessel and make those connections. So it was challenging, definitely, but you know we were all safe, and this, yeah. especially for the elders, that was really important. Absolutely, so it worked out. Yeah, that's good. If you were still able to have experiential, uh, ex you know, skills put in place, people, there's nothing. There's nothing uh, more valuable than putting your hands on the on the land, eh? So that's really yeah, great. absolutely, great. yeah. Um, now we're going to get into talking about the um, billboard series that then became the book, uh, photo book. And um, I, I just, I, it kind of, it struck me because I learned through, you know, doing my little research with you that you're a twin. I am. And, and the fact that uh, you have created these expressions and combating the racism by turning your subjects and I'm and I have to apologize for that word because I'm not a fan of that word but you know the people who you photograph you kind of turn them into twins 
And I'm, and I'm just wondering if that was conscious on your part or what was, or may, or am I getting too heady with your, with, with that idea? Well, you know what, I'm, I'm glad you actually said that because uh, all of my work is in relationship with my twin. So all of my art creations has everything to do with walking the world with another person beside me. So my uh, being in the womb together, um, coming out together, sleeping together, you know, we, we would rock our cribs together so that we could help each other into each other's cribs. My parents couldn't separate us. And so I look back at my work and I realized that, yeah, a lot of my work is about walking a pathway with another person and that being my twin. And so I hadn't put that together, but it doesn't surprise me at all that um, <laughs> I, in some way, created a twin piece. But I'm, I'm not, I, I, it kind of struck me because I didn't, that was something I didn't ever know about you before that you were a twin. And in Haudenosaunee creation story, we have twins. Uh, they are born to Sky Woman's daughter. And she has these twins who then go on to, you know, they represent night, day, bad, good. And oh, you know, okay. that kind of relates to the, the photo series that you've created too, because we've got um, two, for people who aren't familiar, there's two uh, portraits, uh, photographs of people, of, of, of the same people. So two portraits for each person. Um, but uh, I want to uh, talk about the, your own portrait that you took. And you photographed a lot of people in Winnipeg, but uh, the portrait that you took of yourself, the first portrait, which is representing the perception that other non-Native people may see, uh, when they um, look at Native people out in the world, in Winnipeg in particular, that you've used the word squaw uh, as a, the, a perceptive word. So tell me what that word means to you. Right. So it's, uh, it's a bastardization word that has turned into a colonial word that um, has shifted so language is really important. And so at one point in time, it may have had uh, a positive imagery in, in our languages, but because of that contact, it's become a derogatory term. So, I mean, I've heard people argue, mostly non-Indigenous people telling us, but it was originally your word, take ownership of it. Well, no, it's, it's, it's changed. And so, um, the word has become um, a derogatory word that you would say towards a woman. And uh, so that's, so when I think about that word, um, I'm not going to own it. Right. Instead, I'm going to show it for what it is. And, and it's a hurtful word. Yeah. As far as yeah. I'm concerned. Yeah. Yeah. And that's how we can own it. We can own it by rejecting it. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that, don't tell me how to use my words. <laughs> right. <laughs> sort of thing, right. Um, and then the second portrait, and I'm, talking, and I'm still with your portrait, your self-portraits. The second portrait you have spelled out to the viewer that, you know, you're Oji Cree, that you're a wife and you're a mother. And I'm just wondering, how do you indigenize, indigenize those roles of wife and mother in your life? Is there ways that you do that particularly? Well, I, by simply existing, I think that's how we indigenize those words. Um, but when I think about the roles and responsibilities of Indigenous women, uh, one of our roles, especially when we have children, is to create a safe environment for them. And uh, the roles of the, the, uh, a baby when they first come out is to give us joy. Mm. Uh, the toddler, because they're inquisitive, they're there to teach us about creating those safe environments, but they're also inquisitive so that we are there to give them answers. Um, and then as they get older, their roles change. And so for me, as a mother, my role is to make sure that they are thriving and moving forward. And as a wife, you know, it's important that uh, I show respect for myself and I show respect for my husband and try to model that in my life. It doesn't always happen, but mm -hmm. <laughs> at least mm -hmm. that's, that's what I try to do. But recognizing that um, as an Indigenous woman, my actions are Indigenized, but also my art is Indigenized as well. And that was a 
that was a lesson that I had to learn from a friend of mine, uh, Jenny Western. She was like, well, yeah, you don't necessarily make work like the Woodland School, but that doesn't mean your art's not Indigenous. And so recognizing that and taking that teaching and that lesson, I realized, oh, yeah, okay. But it also means that you become a role model Mm. and that you have to show the way for people who are coming up from behind. And so you have to do a lot of modeling. Mm. And so that's a really important thing is is, um, mentorship. Yeah. Absolutely. And Casey, you know, you're such a full blown artist, like you're full, you know, you're one of the very lucky people who get to work full time uh, in art and teaching art and mentoring and um, gathering inspiration from lots of different experiences and things. So I'm just, I'm just curious to know what does your twin do and what does your husband do for a living? Well, um, my sister, she works for uh, the Manitoba government uh, in vital statistics. However, um, she loves to cook. And we realize that she is actually quite artistic. She is exceptional with um, clay, working on a wheel. Because we found out that she's a kinetic worker. Um, and that her eyes are not connected to her body properly. Oh, so her vision is screws her up. And so she can she can actually connect to the art creating process if she closes her eyes. So art doesn't have to be about drawing or painting. Art is art can be so many different things. And and I'm glad you actually brought that up because uh, in our in Ojibwe and Cree culture to create beautiful things was our way of communicating to others about our relationships, relationship to the spirit world, relationship to the land and relationship to the animals. Um, A lot of knowledge was put into these, these art pieces, but everyone did it. Mm. So technically we're all artists. Yes. Amen. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Oh, as they say. And the reason why I was asking what your husband does, because I just wanted to know, you know, with your full blown art career, how much, what kind of support do you get from, from the family members? He, he is my assistant. Oh, lots of support. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. So he makes me meals. Um, He, uh, he helps me lift heavy objects when I, when I can't do it. Um, he, yeah, he picks up the slack when I can't, can't do it. Cause as you know, you know, a lot of women, we take on a lot of roles yeah. as, as a mother, uh, especially when we become, become mothers, but uh, you know, we're out there helping community. We're out there helping our family. We're also taking care of ourselves. And, yes. and then, Oh, it was time to do housework. Tell me. Yeah. <laughs> tell me all about that. It's so, so true. Um, yeah. So thank you for that. Thank you for sharing, being ca- candid with that. Um, in Katharina Vermette's uh, foreword to your book, and uh, by the way, Katharina Vermette just was nominated for the Giller Prize, which is like a $100,000 uh, prize. And, and there's only like, I, I can't remember how, maybe just three, three uh, nominate, nominees for that title, uh, for her book, The Strangers. But so that's, you know, the excellence that you live amongst there. Um, She describes in the foreword, she describes uh, what it was like to be photographed by you and uh, for this series. And for the the first photograph, you are asking the participants to think of a time when they feel less than or not worthy or that they didn't belong. And which is, you know, can bring, our memories back to some really dark episodes and experiences. Um, so I'm wondering what are those e- episodes and experiences for you? When, when, when you were photographing yourself, what are some things that you were thinking about for the first photograph? Right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll actually tell you about um, what I did with my mother. Uh, my mother, I had taken several photographs at this point in time and my mom came up to me and said, you know, I would be willing to be a part of this photo series if you're interested. And this is from a, um, my mom who, who uh, grew up ashamed of her culture and didn't grow up with her culture. Uh, her grandmother uh, would speak Cree, 
but she didn't want to teach her because she knew the implications would be bad. So my mom has been very tentative about learning about her culture. And so I said, okay, great, mom, I'll take up your photo, look into the lens. I'm going to say something to you. I want you to just keep staring into the lens and I want you to just hear my words. I don't want you to act. I just want to hear my, you to hear my words. And so I started telling her, I said, okay, well, I want you to think about when you were little and uh, kids called you a dirty little Indian. And then next thing you know, her eyes started to weep. Her eyes filled up with tears. And I took, I think maybe four photographs. And then I had to console her. Mm-hmm. And it was really heartbreaking because mm-hmm. that's that was my process was to say something hard that they personally experienced and I would get the reaction. And I did not expect to see my grown mother cry mm-hmm. over those little words. Mm-hmm. And um, so it took us a while to get her back to feeling good. And I, I would often say, well, think about the first time you made out with your husband. Uh, <laughs> she just kind of gave me a grimace. And I... <laughs> <laughs> so that didn't work. Uh, usually people laugh and start smiling. Um, so I had to say, well, think about the first time that you held your grandchild, your first grandchild in your arms, which was my niece, Jody, my twin sister's daughter. And uh, suddenly the look that you see in her photograph, which we'll put up for everyone to see, um, yeah, that's, that's her, her, that's her honest reactions. And, and I have to say with everyone else, it was the same. It was harder for me though, because mm. I knew what I was doing. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. But still th- that makes the cover and look at that. Oh yeah. my goodness. And then yeah. you are at the back. Yeah. So, you know, you must've been thinking about some heavy, heavy stuff. Um, and that's, and that's fine, it, it, you know, to uh, have the, as long as there's like a, a, a little uh, safety net there, where did you find, and then, uh, and then maybe that brings us to talk about the protocol that you had discovered in the process. And again, I love just how organic uh, the process of this series is, because you were, you were allowing the process to teach you, uh, you didn't go in with these ideas and these methodologies and things. Um, they were kind of coming to you as in, as you're inside the work already. And one of the first people that you photographed is a woman who I have great respect for, Kim Wheeler, uh, being a radio person and, you know, a communications person. That's my kind of gal. And uh, Kim has uh, alluded to the fact that she has some roots here on Six Nations. So, yay, Haudenosaunee. Uh, <laughs> and, um, but, uh, you know, what a dynamic woman. Uh, and, you know, person to have there in Winnipeg, you, you know, you guys are so lucky to have her over there. Um, but in that, in, in the process of photographing Kim, you said you had discovered some protocol around uh, that would take you through photographing the rest of the series. What was that protocol? Right. So what happened was uh, Lori Steves, a mayoral candidate's wife, had made some comments on social media that were really inaccurate and quite frankly, terrible. And so I wanted to respond to it by creating some photos on social media. Kim was one of the first people to contact me. So I went over to her place and I I took a couple of test photos of my husband. um, And it was just going to be one photo, actually, to be honest with you. And so I sat down and I was talking with Kim and she was talking about um, how she's perceived in or how she sees Indigenous people perceived in media Um, her personal experiences, um, the sort of experiences of discrimination and assumptions that are placed upon her. We can't just, I can't be doing just one photograph. Mm. I need to do two. Mm. One really with the reaction of, of the discrimination that she's experienced, but then have the other one where it talks about how she sees herself. She was sharing with me about um, how she sees herself and how proud of the fact that she was a jet season tickets holder, which was very rare. It was really hard to get season tickets um, as a season ticket holder at that point in time. And so she's like, I have a mortgage. I've got this producer job and I've got all this going for me. And I have this wonderful family and I pay taxes. 
And yet when people look at me, they have this different perception. So just through talking with her, I was able to work out, okay, this is going to become a two image photograph and we're going to do it this way. So it was really, I credit her so much to, to birth of perception. And, and that's what I'm talking about. Social practice art. It wasn't just me taking photographs of, of the people we were sitting down, they're sharing, they're putting their face, they're putting their, who they are as a person out for ridicule potentially. Yeah. And um, like, I was really honored that they trusted me to do that. And as it, as it had, you know, stood, it was, um, it was great. And I don't think anyone had a difficult um, uh, backlash actually. That's really good to hear. That is really yeah. good. So would you say that the intention of the series to combat racism or open dialogues, was that, was that successful then? Oh, a hundred percent. That's great. hundred percent. Absolutely. There's no question. I think what, what, what people were saying to me who are non-Indigenous, um, they were saying what was so successful about it or what they appreciated about it was the fact that I wasn't pointing fingers at anybody. So it allowed them to be in a safe space where they can address their own, their mm. own biases. Mm. And they were able to look at it and also look into the eyes of the, the people that I was photographing, because a lot of these images were big, giant posters, right? So, um, and we also had a billboard. So you were able to, to actually confront these posters and look straight into the eyes of the, the people that were posing and, uh, and they were able to feel what they were feeling. Amazing. That's just yeah. amazing. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing that in um, the uh, campaign now that for, uh, what is it, Prime Minister, we have a Prime Minister, Prime Minister, <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> um, campaign where, you know, the mudslinging, it just, it just, it just, it just depletes your energy, you know, so there's mm -hmm. no, um, I find it kind of uh, anti-progressive uh, or, or what have you just, uh, uh, to to take that road. So the way that uh, that you're presenting this work, uh, putting the face right in front of the face, it's like getting in your face, but we're not telling you how to react. You can react how you need to react. And this is just wonderful. Uh, Casey, what's next for you? Well, actually, I just started a master's program in curatorial studies at the University of Winnipeg. So Yay. I'm doing that. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, I just completed a public art sculpture at the Forks, which is exciting. I have another one that I co-curated co -curated with um, Val Vint and Jamie Isaac. We did a giant kneeling pregnant mom mm. called Nimama, and she faces the east. She faces Nibe, the mm -hmm. water. And uh, she represents uh, all of our mother and the importance of taking care of Mother Earth and taking care of our mother to make sure that the next seven generations have a uh, good quality of life and healthy drinking water. Yeah, so, yeah. that's again, speaking of uh, campaigns, yes, indeed. Uh, hopefully there will be a time when we, that's not on the campaign um, roster but thank you for doing all that you do now so that uh concludes our little chat casey thanks again it was so good to see you you look so oh, well you look so thank healthy. you yeah. i just i just want to say also that along with the book yes uh, you can request a teacher's guide so that you can bring it into the classroom excellent yeah. oh that's so yeah. great and nice. i have to say just one thing before i i say goodbye is just the uh, children um, I met a group of kids who sat down with me and they talked about how they felt discriminated against because of their age and how adults don't listen to them. So it's really interesting how this, this body of work, which I never thought it would have this kind of impact, was a voice for them as well. Oh, wow. That's so beautiful. Children's rights you know absolutely yeah yeah i remember i remember be becoming aware of children's rights the same time i was becoming aware of women's rights because i was raised by a feminist and so the children's rights was parallel to what was happening there so this is wonderful to hear that that's come back 
and uh, it's in the um, the consciousness of these young people. That's exciting. Yeah, That's it's so really exciting. great. So we're going to um, say once again, Nyawagoa. Thank you, Chimagwitch. Really appreciate you taking the time to speak with us at Good Minds. And uh, as we um, say goodbye, we're going to remind you that if you're interested in purchasing any of our books, uh, please contact goodminds.com and use the promo code 13 moons 13 reads at checkout to receive free shipping on your next order and that's going to save you a whole bunch of money. Remember to order all your indigenous books at goodminds.com because their selection and collection is vast. <laughs> and uh, we thank you for supporting indigenous owned businesses and thanks for tuning in make sure that you subscribe to good minds uh, YouTube channel uh, follow hit the like button and follow us and um, on the Facebook and on the Twitters all the the social medias and uh, uh, make a comment on the YouTube, uh, this YouTube um, episode, and you could win a free copy of Casey's book, Casey Adams' book, which is Perspe Perception, a photo series. That could be yours if you make a comment. So thanks so much for tuning in in this September moon and join us again for October moon coming up uh, in another month. And uh, we'll let you know who we're going to be chatting with next. And Casey, thank you so much again. Take care. Hey, go sunny. Okay.